Okay, so some further criticisms of divine command theory, which don't necessarily have anything to do with kind of the metaphysics of the situation the way that the Euthyphro dilemma does. Um, one criticism is this. So why exactly does every obligation need to be grounded in a command? So why must it be the case that um, there can't be obligations independently of there being commands? Um, if you go back to the um, main video on divine command theory, that was a, a crucial premise in one of the arguments, that for every obligation there's a corresponding command. Um, now, if all that means is linguistically every obligation can be expressed as a command. So I have an obligation to refrain from murder, so there's a corresponding command, do not murder. So the fact that every obligation can be expressed as a command, that's just something that's linguistic. And if that's all that premise means in that argument, then that premise isn't actually doing any work in the argument. Um, what we need is something stronger like I mentioned in the video. What we need is something like every obligation is grounded in a command. But why think that? Um, it seems that there are lots of things that I've never been commanded to do or not do that it still seems that I have an obligation to do or an obligation to refrain from doing. So um, I've never particularly been commanded, uh, I don't know, to not kidnap people and pelt them with baby tomatoes or, you know, cherry tomatoes. Or I've, Nobody's ever commanded me to not kidnap people and pelt them with tomatoes. Um, but it still seems that I have an obligation to refrain in engaging in that, in that kind of behavior. So uh, what the, the divine command theorist here needs to give some good reason why there can't be obligations independently um, of their being commands. So commands are linguistic constructions. So why say that uh, obligations depend on there being certain kinds of linguistic constructions? Yeah, commands are speech acts, right? Um, uh, my children, I've never told my children not to eat all the cookies. Like that, that kind of command has never been uttered from my mouth. But my children still have an obligation to not eat all of the cookies before dinner, regardless of whether or not I say anything about it. Um, if, if I went in the kitchen and my daughter was had eaten an entire plate of cookies, I would be incredulous. I would say, why would you do that? And if she said, well, you never told me not to, um, it seems that some kind of common sense would have to prevail here. Now, so same with you and I. Why say that there can't be obligations independently of commands? That does not seem straightforward. It, it does not seem obvious that that's the case. Okay, furthermore, um, how exactly do we determine when God has actually issued a command? Um, so if you look at the history of monotheistic religions in particular, there's there's lots of bad examples of, of people thinking that God was commanding them to do something um, or claiming to speak on God's behalf and so on and so forth, you know, thus saith the Lord and things like that. But uh, again, just thinking about things in terms of common sense prevailing, you and I should seriously wonder, um, based on the content of what people are saying, whether or not they're actually in contact with some kind of uh, divine being. So, I mean, years ago, a woman, Andrea Yates, was seriously convinced that God was telling her to drown her children. And she she killed all of her children. Turned out she had really extreme uh, postpartum depression. And it was so bad that she was not found uh, criminally liable for the death of her children. Um, you know, she, she, she took an insanity plea and, you know, psychologically um, she had so much psychological trauma and her depression was so bad that she she quite literally didn't know what she was doing. Now, but for all you and I know, what basis would we have to say, oh, well, well, clearly this was not a, a divine command. But for all you and I know, it, it could have been. So this is where things get a little bit tricky. Um, what we might want to say is this. Well, we we know that 
certain commands are genuine when they don't conflict with our basic moral intuitions. So the command that I drown my children in the bathtub, since I, I have reason to believe that that would be wrong to do, this conflicts with my basic moral intuitions, so I have reason to discredit this as a genuine divine command. But therein lies the problem. Um, if I'm testing supposed commands against my basic moral intuitions, then it seems that it is my moral intuitions which are authoritative here, and not the commands themselves, which are authoritative. Now, and you can also get a euthyphro-type problem here around, okay, well, God would never command me to do anything which violates my basic moral intuitions. Okay, well, why? Well, because my basic moral intuitions are truth-tracking as far as what the moral facts are. Well, why are they? You know, so if epistemically speaking, God's commands provide us with knowledge of what's right and wrong or what's good and evil. We need some criteria to be able to determine which commands are genuine, which supposed commands are genuine, and then which ones are just given to us by religious rulers. Um, if you know anything about the history of indulgences in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, hey, for, for certain sums of money, we can pray your relatives out of purgatory, but there's nothing in the scriptures which say anything about indulgences or purgatory or you know being able to pray people out of purgatory for certain sums of money but if you don't know the text of your particular religion and you have to have somebody translate it for you in your own language how do you know what it actually says how do you know when it's actually genuine so epistemically here it seems that we do lack some definitive criteria that allows us to tell the difference between this is a genuine command of God and this is not, All right? Okay, and then the last criticism I'll mention here, and this one seems pretty obvious, is this. Um, divine command theory is incompatible with atheism. Uh, it, it can't be the case that uh, moral features depend for their existence on on God and God's commandments um, if there is no God, clearly. Now, you could say... Um, if God existed, then the moral facts or the moral features would depend upon God. So there are there are atheists who are moral nihilists, sure, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, uh, if you're an atheist, you can't be a divine command theorist. Now, so that seems obvious, but here's the more crucial point. Um, if divine command theory is incompatible with atheism, that means that any evidence we have in favor of atheism is evidence against divine command theory. So any evidence we have in favor of atheism um, is evidence against divine command theory by default, since atheism and divine command theory are incompatible positions. Um, and this is where, if you want to appeal to uh, evidence in favor of atheism, evidence in favor of the position that there is no God, um, it seems that the existence of particularly horrendous and destructive evils and suffering, uh, these kinds of things constitute pretty strong evidence uh, for the position that there is no God. Um, we don't have time to go over those kinds of arguments, but um, the existence of particularly horrendous and destructive sufferings should give the theist pause in you know making assertions about you know how confident that there are they are that there is an all-powerful all-knowing, uh, and perfectly good being, uh, because that does seem at least prima facie, that does seem to cut against the grain here. Um, and again, and, and if we're more confident of the fact that murder is morally wrong than we are that God exists, it does seem that there is some kind of conflict here in saying that one fact is dependent upon uh, the other fact. Now, I'm not saying here that there's that this conflict can't be resolved. I'm just saying prima facie, if if you're if you're more willing to say, that you're pretty confident in the fact that murder is morally wrong than you are to say that God exists. Um, you do, at least on the surface, have some reason to believe, uh, on the surface, have some reason to believe that, well, potentially these two facts don't have anything to do with each other then. So again, um, if you're inclined to say, I think murder would be morally wrong regardless of whether or not God existed, then you do have some reason not to accept divine command theory. Now, it could turn out that that's just an inconsistent position. Um, if if it's not possible for there to be any moral features independently um, of God's existence or independently of God's commands, 
Okay, then that means that if you're an atheist, you have to be a moral nihilist of some kind. Now, but if you think that atheism can be uh, or is consistent with a, a more robust form of moral realism, then you wouldn't need to necessarily uh, rest all of your, your loyals or put all your eggs in the basket of God existing or, or certain moral features being dependent upon uh, God's existence or God commands. God's commands. Okay. All right. So that will wrap up this unit. Once again, uh, don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions on these videos and I'll see you all soon.